I don't like being called a special effects wizard because it pigeonholes me as that when I'm, my real passion is making movies. And I've, I've been using visual effects as a way to get to a higher place. Film director, special effects supervisor, inventor. His work has spanned across films such as 2001, A Space Odyssey, to Close Encounters of the Third Kind. In 2016, he received the Society of Motion Picture and Television Engineers' most prestigious award, the Progress Medal, in recognition of his numerous contributions to photographic processes and technologies in visual effects and high frame rate, or HFR, cinematography. Moving Images recently sat down with Doug Trumbull to discuss the exponential growth and future of cinematographic technology. I remember when I was young, I was profoundly affected by movies. I was watching the wonderful world of Disney. I was watching these space movies. Um, when Worlds Collide, uh, Forbidden Planet, these were really formative movies to me. I had no idea I was actually going to be in the movie industry. I was just a really good viewer, and I became completely enamored of science fiction. So all my reading, my literature, was science fiction literature. and so. When I started becoming an artist, you know, right in my final year of high school and first year of junior college, my portfolio was filled with spaceships and alien planets. And that's what ultimately landed my job working with Stanley Kubrick on 2001, was that interest. And the fact that my father was an engineer, my mother was an artist, I kind of came with this genetic code that made it really easy to do visual effects and solve technical problems that were technical and creative. That's the whole thing that I find comes into perfect balance in movies. Because you know, if, you want, if you're creative, you could be a writer, you can be alone in your garret and write your novel. You could be a sculptor, you can be alone, you can sculpt. If you want to uh, paint or write poetry or any number of creative things you can do. But in the movie business, it's a very collaborative, multitasker kind of business that's a technical business. And I find that some of the most successful directors are the, are the ones who make it their business to understand the technology of the industry as much as they possibly can. Jim Cameron is a really good example of that. He's extremely technically astute. If it weren't for that, we wouldn't have Avatar. That was a complete breakout movie in every way. It completely deconstructed the methodology for making movies and directing movies and writing movies, editing movies, doing visual effects for movies. Avatar stands alone as a major breakthrough and it's great that it stands alone as the most profitable movie of all time. So pay attention. Movies are technical. When I was a child, you would go out to a movie and see uh, two movies back to back in a double bill. You'd see a documentary, a cartoon, any, any number of things, some news even in the very early days. And then when television started taking away people's viewing habits, it, initially the studios were terrified by that and they started developing all kinds of new film processes to get people back into theaters, which was Cinerama, Cinemascope, D150, Todd AO, VistaVision, uh, were ways of trying to keep people in theaters by offering more spectacle that, that you couldn't get on a television set. But in the transition to multiplex theaters, the movie industry really became the television industry. And right now, we're at a moment in time where the technical specifications for a movie and a television show are identical. The quality and size and focal lengths of lens and cameras, they're all the same between television and movies. I think what's been lost is this sense of uh, showmanship and, and, and immersion and spectacle that you can get on a giant screen in a big theater. And I've been very conscious of this for a long, long time. And even when I was working with Stanley Kubrick back on 2001, he was conscious of the fact that 24 frames a second is just not enough. And we were, we were trying to move stars across the screen, which seems like a very simple thing. But because of the double shutter in the projector, we were seeing two stars, and if it went too fast, you'd see three stars. And he said, what's this? And he said, well, it's, it's one of the artifacts of the inadequacies of 24 frames and the fact that every frame is shown twice. And that was the beginning of my consciousness of the fact that now that we're in the digital realm, we can abandon all the old standards of shutter openings and resolution and frame rates and look at the, the industry 
with fresh eyes and take advantage of uh, the power of digital. Because you can buy a camera for not you know, a few hundred dollars. You can plug that data card right into your laptop and edit it right there on any editing system. And it's just enabled a tremendous explosion of content. You know, it wasn't that many years ago when there were only maybe six television channels. Now there's hundreds of television channels of every conceivable content, including a lot of really great documentaries that would not get made if it had to be filmed. The big blockbuster sequel tentpoles, they think make the most money. The studios really believe that's where their, their business model really is. And that's largely true. I mean, if you look at the, the grosses on conventional movies or just story-driven movies or love stories or, or traditional movies, they don't gross in those really high blockbuster uh, realms of making a billion, two billion dollars. And so they gravitate toward where the big bucks are. And that's okay, I don't, I'm not averse to that. It just tends to get a little childish sometimes. My take on the movie industry in general is that uh, it's in trouble, at least domestically. The exhibition industry in this country, in the United States, is declining, has been declining for about 20 years. And fewer and fewer people are going out to see a movie in a movie theater because they can stream it and download it and get Netflix and HBO and Hulu and. Uh, have the diversity of content and ease of use, and they're perfectly happy to look at a, at a movie on their tablet or their smartphone or their computer or their television screen. So there is a decline going on, and I'm very sad about it, and I've been trying to spend all my energy trying to bring back what was so much fun for me when I worked with Kubrick on 2001, when we had these giant 100-foot wide movie screens in these spectacular movie theaters, and it was a big, immersive experience, and that doesn't exist today. We multiplexed ourselves into small screens. The fact that the movie business has trended toward these um, sequel, blockbuster, cape crusader, comic hero thing is really ultimately going to fail. I don't think it's very satisfactory. I think it's catering to a very narrow demographic of age group, and I'm very frustrated by it, and I think it's ultimately not going to play out because we're seeing failures of those now. They've been predicted by Spielberg and Lucas and other visionaries in the industry that a movie that's depending almost entirely on visual effects that has no story or very little character development is ultimately kind of unsatisfying. This object behind me is called the Magi Pod. It's just a, a name for uh, the idea that if you quadruple the resolution of the image, it's 4K instead of 2K, so it's actually twice as high, twice as wide numbers of pixels, 4,000 pixels wide instead of 2,000 pixels wide. When you double the number of pixels, you can increase the width of the screen and still have the same resolution. So we've, we've increased the resolution, the width of the screen tremendously. Uh, and we've done this Taurus screen, which is a hemispherically curved screen that's like a big mirror that reflects the light back to the audience that recovers the light that's lost on a white screen so that the image brightness is back to where it should be at about 14 or 15 foot Lamberts, which it's never on a 3D movie. And the frame rate is up to 120 frames per second. And that means all the blurring and strobing that you've gotten used to all your life of when a fast pan happens or when a fist moves across the screen or some fast action in a movie, it's all blurred. You know, if you just freeze that frame during an action sequence in any conventional movie, you'll see that the, all, the, all the information is blurred. It's lost, it's not there. And the major directors who have explored 3D photography and, and production have all realized that 3D reveals all the inadequacies of 24 frames. It's really critically important. So Peter Jackson wanted to double the frame rate to 48. Uh, Jim Cameron would like to do 48 or 60. And Ang Lee has now done 120 as a result of having been here and seen what we're doing. And that gets rid of all those old hang-ups that the movie business has had that have inhibited production. And it now enables the kind of movies that Hollywood wants to make, you know, these blockbuster epics with a lot of action. It makes that much, much, much better. Uh, and it 
it comes partly from when I worked on the Back to the Future ride for Spielberg. We, we felt you were, you were actually in the movie. You, you get in the DeLorean car and you, you enter the proscenium arch in a way and become part of the movie and be, actually become a character in the movie. So this technology is really revealing a whole new realm of uh, immersion and participation for the audience to feel like they're becoming characters in the movie or they're actually in a battle scene like Ang Lee's doing with, with Billy Lynn. Um, it's going to be a stunning revelation to see how audiences respond to the fact that it's extremely powerful, like a real experience. I'm not trying to replace conventional movies. Conventional movies of 24 frames on a rectangular screen are fantastic. They tell stories, they get you emotionally involved, it's wonderful for actors and actresses and directors and writers and producers. It's a great art form that I don't want to mess with. I'm not attacking that in any way. I'm just offering another alternative for the audience to say, well, if I want to be really immersed and overwhelmed, you can go into one of these theaters and you're going to get better picture, better sound, better 3D, better viewing angle, better immersion than in any other medium there is. Well, my father never talked very much about his years in the movie industry. He actually didn't like it very much. He had a lot of fun. He was a young guy like I was on 2001, and he was, he was manipulating the lion's tail and the Wizard of Oz and helping rig the flying monkeys, wire rigs and stuff like that. But that was at a time where there was a lot of turmoil in the movie industry, and there was a lot of unionization, and he wasn't much of a joiner. And He went off into the aircraft and aerospace industry, which was much more satisfying to him. He left the movie industry before I was born. I brought him back into the movie industry when I did Silent Running. And he, be, he loved it, and he joined forces with a lot of my pals and formed ILM. The original ILM was my father and, and John Dykstra and other people that worked with me on Silent Running. I have two really great experiences directing. One of them was with Bruce Dern and Silent Running. And I was, a lear I was a learner. I had no clue how to make a movie when I started making that movie. I was just there for the circumstances of having been I wrote this, the original story, and I knew how to do it, and the studio said, well, why don't we just have Doug direct it, because no one else will get it. So I'm directing, and I don't know how to direct. And so Bruce Dern is saying, well, here's, I'm going to tell you all about acting. And he says, I says, Doug, I'm a method actor. Do you know what that means? I say, no. He says, well, we use techniques, emotional techniques, in ourselves and in our consciousness to try to deliver to you some emotional moment. And he said, you're asking me to do this moment where I'm, I'm filled with remorse and I'm actually going to cry on camera because I've killed this, this guy or these three guys. And he said, I'm going to tell you how I do it. And I said, OK, I want to hear how you're going to do it. He says, well, when I'm doing your dialogue and I'm looking at the camera and I'm crying for you in this movie, what I'm thinking about is the death of my daughter who drowned in a swimming pool accident. That's where he is emotionally, and he's going to deliver that emotion to the camera for the audience to get in the context of my movie. And I shot one take, and I said, that's all I want. You did it. We got it. The shot actually is a little bit out of focus. And I felt like I didn't want to put him through that again. And I had a similar experience with Louise Fletcher on, on, uh, on Brainstorm. And she's dying of a heart attack. And she had to feel the pain of this heart attack. And she'd rehearsed this thing, and she kind of developed this whole scene herself of the kind of pain that she was feeling in her left arm and this kind of freezing up of her body. And she had to walk across the room and sit in a chair and put this helmet on and record her death. And it was a very, very tricky and complicated shot that had all kinds of visual effects and projectors and laser beams and crap going on the set. And she had to do this scene. And it was so perfect when she did it that I just, I just said, cut, that's it. One take, we're done. This is, I didn't want to go through it again, and I, I imagine she didn't want to go through it again. And there's moments that you know you've got it in the, in, the, in the can. As long as it's in focus and everything works well, you've got it and you just move on. But those are, for me, those are usually the moments when I know an actor or actress has been put through some kind of personal, emotional stretch to get there. And you're really lucky when that happens while the camera's rolling. You are manipulating people's emotions a lot. 
I think that movies are, are a kind of a surrogate emotional release. People go to the theater to, to feel and experience stuff that's, that they can do in a movie theater safely. It's dark. If they cry, no one's going to notice. If they feel something profoundly, it really relates to their real life or their lost child or their dying mother, whatever their personal stories are. A movie theater is a great communal place to participate in an, emotion, an emotional release. I think it's one of the greatest services that movies provide is a safe place to get rid of a lot of stuff that we all carry around. It's, it's what everyone's looking for uh, in making movies. It's what they're hunting for when they show a preview of a movie and they'll say, well, yeah, the audience got to that point in the movie, but it didn't quite work. There's something kind of wrong there with what she said or what he looked like or what his expression was. And the studio will react to that and go back and sometimes reshoot it or recut it to try to evoke the response that they're hoping for, which they hope will lead to box office revenues, nothing more than that. But they know that you get there through the functionality of the movie actually delivering a satisfactory experience for the audience. I think audiences do want to sit back and be entertained. I don't think audiences naturally want to be into virtual reality where they have to look around and think about things. I think that the, the present interest in virtual reality is really interesting because it represents to me that people want immersive experiences. They want spectacle and they want to be taken out of their everyday life. They want to be taken and transported into some alternate reality, whether it's another planet, another time and space. Um, in another time in history or, or some situation that's impossible or risky or violent or uh, beautiful. Uh, I think people really want that. I, there's no question in my mind that all, the, all my experience with IMAX and with ShowScan and with giant screens and with the Back to the Future ride have shown me that people really love this stuff. If you're, if you're aiming a camera at actors and actresses in a set or on a location, the audience doesn't know that right, up, right outside the edge of that frame there's a million grip stands and lights and kooks and microphones and all kinds of other stuff that are the paraphernalia of making that image look beautiful, making that lighting on the woman's face or the guy's face or whatever look really compelling and exciting and, and uh, beautifully photographed. When you do VR and you're shooting 360 degrees, that's almost impossible. So I don't think VR is a magic bullet. I don't think it's going to solve everything. I think it's much more appropriately used for like gaming where you're interacting and you're controlling the direction you're going and you're controlling what's going on in a game and it's good to look behind your head and see if the, if the monster's back there or whatever. So I think there's tremendous room for VR. I think that there's another area that's going to be possibly much more impactful, which is AR, augmented reality, or, or what Roni Abovitz at Magic Leap calls mixed reality, where you're able to see the real world, but the optical system that's in your glasses is actually adding characters or things or objects to your field of view that seem to be right in front of you and on the table or in the room with you and interacting with you in a completely different way so that you don't lose your bearings. You don't have to put on some big headset and give up the real world so you have the real world with things augmenting it. I think that's going to be really important and really interesting to see how that develops creatively. Well, a lot of people talk about movies as storytelling, and I think that's great. That's, that's what most movies are. That's what most television shows are. But there's another aspect to it, which is experience making, which is much more like IMAX or Cinerama or the whole idea of the, the scope of the image being so epic and spectacular that it's an experience for the audience. And it's not necessarily locked exactly to the storytelling part of it. There's a lot of times that I've worked on movies to where the story stops and the experience carries on. This was true in 2001 where you just go into this big trip at the end of the movie that's 17 minutes long with no storytelling at all. There's no plot, no drama, no dialogue, no actors, no nothing. It's just a big experience. And that's been a very important um, kind of touchstone for me about my, my responsibility to try to make experiences that go beyond the limitations of story. So I think I'm really happy that Kubrick chose me to do it. I, I got the job because I was precocious enough to cold call him and ask for a job. So it worked both ways. 
I think I'm still most proud of uh, 2001. Even though I was only a small cog in a much bigger wheel, uh, I'm proud of it because I think the movie's really valid. I'm proud of it because I was working with a genius, Stanley Kubrick. I'm proud of it because it was transformational for me and it really set the tone of my whole career. And I'm proud of it because it still shows today, 50 years later, and still holds up in, in the way that most movies don't. And I think we're in an era where movies are consumables, you know, they're expendables. You can make a movie this year that will make a ton of money and next year, no one will remember what it was because it's just, it's gone off into the netherworld of uh, reruns and uh, oblivion sometimes. And I think the fact that 2001 still holds up is testament to the fact that it was just an extraordinarily unusual cinematic moment that I was really lucky to, to be involved in. Thank you.